So thank you all for this opportunity uh, and everybody for being here. Uh, I'm going to talk, um, kind of walking through how um, we, the authors, uh, suggest going about teaching flexural strength and failure modes for reinforced concrete beams uh, in Concrete One. And I want to be sure uh, to acknowledge Fred Meyer from West Point and Brandon Ross from Clemson uh, as co-authors that really did a lot of the heavy lifting on this paper. Uh, and I get to be here uh, and have fun with you guys today. Uh, but starting out, you know, flexural strength is one of those fundamental topics for Concrete One. Uh, we think, you know, it could be the most important to topic that we cover because it's foundational to the rest of the course. It's foundational for courses that come afterward. Uh, and, you know, if we break it down kind of to the basics, uh, we ignore the concrete tensile strength uh, and add steel reinforcement to be able to, uh, to take the tension forces within the beam, uh, which, you know, we need some background in mechanics and materials and material behavior uh, to be able to do that. Uh, but kind of, you know, as you've seen in all these presentations this afternoon, uh, it's not just the content, which we all, you know, are familiar with as experts in concrete, you know, that we covered uh, in our undergraduate master's PhD studies, um, but it's how it's delivered. And we want to be able to deliver this content uh, in a way that addresses the different learning styles and learning preferences for our students. Uh, and we're often not trained uh, really in how to do that when we go through our, our PhD program. Uh, we tend to just emulate what we've seen, uh, what works for us, but maybe that's not great, you know, for all of our students. So, you know, like I said, looking in this presentation, we're kind of bringing in a summary of how we teach this topic in Reinforced Concrete 1 and some of the approaches that we use. Uh, and, you know, we encourage you to, to think about your own ideas and incorporate those in, our, in your classes. Uh, but this is based on kind of a two to four lecture period time frame, uh, depending on the length of your classes. Uh, and, you know, in terms of presenting your material, you know, you want to make sure you match with your textbook uh, so that your notation is consistent. Uh, and then, you know, you bring in the code uh, as well as the theory uh, and bring in the fact that these failure modes that we're going to be talking about are based on the amount of reinforcement. So we're talking about tension controlled failures uh, or under reinforced beams, uh, depending on your preferred terminology, uh, compression controlled or over reinforced beams, uh, and then the definitions of those based on the strain in the steel. And so the question is, how do we do that uh, in a way that is approachable for the students? Uh, you know, we want the steel uh, in our beams to yield and produce a ductile failure or a tension controlled failure. Uh, we're always gonna have a secondary compression um, failure that's often confusing for the students. Uh, in the code, you know, we're defining this compression or tension controlled failure as uh, a maximum uh, strain in our extreme tension steel greater than the yield strain plus 0 0.003, uh, which takes us to a fee of 0.9 uh, according to ACI 318.21.2.1. Uh, for a compression controlled failure, uh, we're going to have a sudden catastrophic failure, which is what we don't want. Uh, in that case, the concrete is going to crush first before the steel yields. Uh, and we're going to have a strain in our extreme tension steel less than the yield strain uh, and have a fee of 0.65 or 0.75, depending on our uh, transverse reinforcement. And, you know, there's a nice figure in the code uh, that shows, you know, the transition from compression control to tension controlled failures and our fee factors. So, you know, we have all this information uh, as the experts in reinforced concrete. We want to transfer that to our students. Uh, and we, the authors, think that the best way to do this is with a combination of methods, uh, bringing in some active learning uh, and creative analogies into our lecturing. Uh, so tying those in uh, during our in-class presentations, uh, as well as some experiential learning and demonstrations outside of the classroom. Uh, again, we want to try to pick activities uh, within these uh, constraints that address those different learning styles. Uh, which is going to be dependent on your specific course context. Uh, but kind of starting with, you know, presentation of the theory in class, you know, we're usually thinking uh, it's going to take you three to four hours to prep this material, uh, about an hour of in-class time. Uh, and you want to go from, you know, a homogeneous beam uh, to a reinforced concrete beam uh, behavior, uh, which is going to be different. Uh, we're going to use the same plane sections, remain plane, uh, and linear strain distribution uh, assumption uh, for our beams, uh, but we're going to have the different idea of where our neutral axis is located and our internal equilibrium 
that goes back to uh, kind of what Chris was talking about in the previous presentation. And so we want to um, combine this discussion uh, with physical models that help us illustrate these concepts. Uh, we want to be sure uh, to communicate the assumptions that are required uh, for this uh, type of analysis. So our ultimate concrete strain at failure is going to be 0 0.003. Uh, our concrete tensile strength is going to be neglected. Um, our reinforcing steel is going to behave in an elastoplastic manner. Uh, we have perfect bond between the steel and the concrete. Uh, and we're going to use that equivalent rectangular stress block um, to determine our capacity uh, as well as come up with our um, strain and failure mode. Uh, so this is kind of an illustration of the same figure uh, that you know Chris showed in the last presentation, uh, but looking at this as a progressive presentation uh, on your um, whiteboard uh, that could be you know combined with some of those physical models uh, where we take our concrete cross section, uh, we have our linear variation of strain uh, within the beam uh, with our ultimate strain and compression of 0 0.003, uh, our steel strain that's going to be proportional to that. Uh, concrete compression strain, uh, and then our internal forces that are based on our equivalent rectangular stress block uh, with, you know, our compression force of 0.85 F prime C B A and our tension force of A S uh, times F sub S, which we hope is F Y for a tension control beam. Uh, but we can use those internal forces and equilibrium to get the moment capacity of our section. Uh, so we have that equation that Chris mentioned of A equals A S F Y over 0.85 F prime C uh, B, as well as our moment capacity uh, of ASFY times D minus A over 2. Uh, we can determine our steel strain from the similar triangles uh, on our strain diagram drawing, uh, where we get um, E sub CU 0 0.003 over C is going to be equal to the strain in our steel that we want to know divided by D minus C. Uh, we use that relationship from our rectangular stress block of A equals beta 1C uh, to get our value of C. We can determine our strain uh, and thereby use that to determine our failure mode uh, and our phi value. Once we have phi, uh, we can use uh, or we can use that to get our design moment capacity to compare to our um, demand. So it, in order to uh, reinforce that material, uh, we like to use some in-class problem solving that can be combined with several different uh, active learning activities, uh, which again will take you a few hours to prepare, uh, a couple of class periods to run through these example problems, uh, but basically to do a progression of examples uh, that allow us to illustrate the concepts of flexural capacity uh, and flexural failure modes. Uh, so, you know, to start with, uh, you look at a rectangular beam with a tension controlled failure, uh, move to a rectangular beam uh, with a tension strain less than uh, the tension controlled limit uh, and a fee less than 0.9, a rectangular beam with a compression controlled failure uh, with a tension strain less than uh, the yield strain, and then move into a beam with compression reinforcement and a T-beam, uh, which is going to be covered in the next presentation. Uh, so you can take uh, the first problem there, uh, so looking at just your simple reinforced concrete beam and work that into an inductive presentation uh, of the material where you work through the example to develop the theory instead of just uh, bringing the theory, uh, you know, and smacking the students in the face with it. Um, you can also bring in those active learning strategies most effectively uh, after you've worked through the first problem with them uh, in problems two and three, whether using a think, pair, and share. Uh, where the students uh, work on their own, work together, and then come back to the class, uh, or you know the students work on it on their own. You maybe bring them to the board to help you fill in the results, um, but it gets the students involved uh, and has them uh, have a contribution to the lecture. Uh, we're um, proponents of the students always having their codes with them, working through these problems, um, so that they can you know physically mark those pages in the code uh, and they can. Uh, use that information as they work through the problems. Uh, so one of the, the authors of this paper has a really nice uh, analogy and thought experiment uh, that kind of falls into that category of creative analogies uh, that will um, really drive this point home uh, to students in terms of failure modes. Uh, it takes about 60 minutes, about an hour to put together uh, and about one class period to actually run through everything. 
Uh, and it's based on the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Uh, so, you know, most students are going to know this story or have at least heard something about it. Uh, and so hopefully it will be a memorable experiment or experience. Uh, I've got these specific learning objectives that go along with it, but we're not going to run through those uh, for the sake of time. You can read those in the paper uh, if you want to. Uh, but basically, you're going to start by telling the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Uh, and you want to make it interesting and memorable. Uh, so at Clemson, uh, it's Baldy Locks and the Three Bears uh, because the instructor has a shaved head. So students are going to you know, catch that point. It's going to get their attention, uh, bring them into uh, the discussion. Uh, you can also have the students help. All right, mo most of them have probably heard this story. They probably know what happens next, uh, so they can help you work through it. Uh, but you do have to remember, you don't want to spend the whole class period telling the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears uh, because they might be upset at how much they paid for that class if that's all you get to. Uh, but as you go through the story, you know, you can emphasize the extremes uh, of the porridge, uh, the softness of the chair and the bed, uh, as well as Goldilocks's preference for a just right uh, heat or softness, um, you know, for these items she was looking at. And that's what we take as analogous to our selection of flexural reinforcement. Uh, we want the just right uh, amount of flexural reinforcement. Uh, and kind of the second step is when we get to deciding what is the just right uh, amount of flexural reinforcement, we have to be sure to dispel the idea that under reinforced is a bad thing uh, because that's what we want. Uh, so we can, you know, use terminology of tension controlled, like what's in the code. Uh, we can have students vote on which one they think is going to be the just right amount of tension reinforcement um, and, you know, have them be invested uh, into that uh, discussion. So once we've decided uh, on the just right amount of tension reinforcement or the tension controlled section, uh, it's helpful to draw that load uh, deformation curve uh, for a tension control beam. Uh, and to walk the students through physically what's happening at each stage uh, of the behavior of that beam. So, you know, starting with uh, linear behavior uh, before the beam cracks, uh, you know, showing concrete compressive strain less than the limit, uh, tension strain in the concrete less than cracking, uh, tension strain in the steel less than yielding, uh, and then moving through, you know, what happens with the first crack, what happens with additional cracking, um, you know, the steel starts to yield, we get this nice ductile behavior, and then eventually the concrete crushes. Uh, then, you know, as part of our uh, analogy, we want to put everything into terms that uh, are accessible to the students in the classroom. So we want definitions uh, that are easy for students to remember, that are accessible to what they know uh, from previous courses. And so for our tension controlled or under reinforced beam, um, we want to drive home that it's a beam when the steel reinforcement yields prior to the concrete crushing and compression. This is our just right amount of steel reinforcement. Uh, so the steel yields is the, the main point we want to drive home there. Uh, and then in an over reinforced or compression control beam, uh, the concrete crushes before the steel yields. Uh, and this is what happens when there's too much reinforcement. Uh, and then kind of a, uh, an author, um, derived term here of critically under reinforced would be a beam where we have uh, in a, uh, not enough steel reinforcement to resist the tension force, the beam cracks and fails uh, almost immediately. Uh, so then moving from the uh, analogy to the thought experiment, um, we give the students a handout uh, that has this just right load deflection curve uh, and have them to draw in the load displacement for the over reinforced and under reinforced beam. Uh, it's important to have them commit uh, to a drawing so that it, you know, drives home the point, uh, whether they're correct or incorrect, uh, to help them remember. Uh, and then we give them uh, a new sheet where they can copy down the correct curves with us or see if they got them right the first time. Uh, and, you know, of course, we want to note the lack of ductility uh, for the under or for the over reinforced uh, and critically under reinforced beams. All right, so I mentioned kind of as we were going through the theory, uh, there were some physical models that would really help uh, break up that discussion and drive home some of the points. Um, you know, Chris described a great one for uh, the rectangular stress block, uh, but one that you can use uh, throughout that discussion and throughout the course uh, is just a foam beam uh, with lines drawn on it to show plane sections remain plain. Uh, you can make one of these in less than half an hour uh, and get materials, you know, at your local craft store. 
Um, it's really helpful for students to see samples of reinforcing steel with different surface conditions, to see the lugs on the steel, um, potentially to see uh, or to visualize bond. Uh, and you can get these from conferences, from CRSI, uh, research specimens, the hardware store, you know, free bars, not that hard to come by. Uh, it's also very helpful if you can get a hold of a section of an actual reinforced concrete beam uh, to, you know, provide some additional visualization uh, beyond, you know, a foam type model. Um, you know, you can cut a section from a specimen from research or build one specifically for this purpose. Uh, and then, you know, it's fairly easy to take a small scale uh, two by two uh, mortar beam, uh, either unreinforced or reinforced with a threaded rod. Uh, to take that into class and actually test it, um, you know, right in front of the students uh, where they can see the difference between uh, unreinforced and reinforced behavior. All right, so um, there's already been some discussion of, of laboratory exercises uh, in terms of experiential learning, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it. Uh, it is time consuming to do one of these, uh, but a lot of classes uh, include a laboratory component for reinforced concrete which is a great place to do this kind of exercise. Uh, and for the, the exercise we describe in our paper, um, you know, the students are given a failure mode. So kind of more of an advanced uh, project. They have to design their beam for that specific failure mode. So either tension controlled, compression controlled, uh, shear, um, a T-beam, uh, they build the beam, they test the beam, uh, and they get to see, you know, how everything goes down uh, as well as to reflect on their observations. Uh, so here are just a few pictures of how the project goes uh, at the University of Oklahoma. Um, you know the tension control beam should have distributed cracks, a lot of residual deflection. So to finish up, um, you know we have a few lessons learned in our paper uh, just from our years of experience in teaching this course. Um, you know if you're doing classroom demonstrations uh, it's good to keep them simple uh, to make them quick and then to make them memorable. Uh, students are going to remember Baldy Locks or Goldilocks. Um, you know, you do, if you do something to grab their attention, um, it's going to be that much better. Um, student comments uh, say that a laboratory experiment experience uh, is very helpful. Um, we've found that students really need perspective on rebar size, spacing, and congestion, which goes back to the detailing presentation. Uh, and then you know, be willing to try new things, uh, but don't, you know, overload yourself at the beginning. And then always ask for, for feedback from the students uh, because they're, you know, willing to, to provide help on what's good for them. All right, so thanks uh, for your attention. Uh, if we have time for questions, happy to, to take those. If not, uh, I'll be here for the rest of this session. All right, thanks, Royce. Yeah, we, we do have time. There is one here in the question and answer. I'll just put it out loud to you. Uh, and it's kind of maybe to the whole group of looks like about 76 people or 82. Um, one of the authors likes the term critically under reinforced uh, for beams with steel less than the minimum. Does anybody dislike that phrase? Is it misleading? Any thoughts on a better phrase? You might be biased, Royce, you're on the paper, but um, other folks in the audience have any kind of ideas on that is one of the questions. Thanks, Brandon. I am uh, biased on that question. Uh, so we would love feedback from anybody that's here. I, I have one question related to it, maybe um, just kind of the flipping between under reinforced uh, compression control, tension control, the phrasing, you know, there's kind of several options. Do you all find it confusing or have you just picked one and go with it or how do you differentiate or, you know? So I prefer to, you know, spend time working with the students on both of those terms, uh, just because, uh, you know, I like to go with what the code says, but when they run into people in practice, they're going to use other terminology. Uh, and so trying to, you know, head it off at the beginning to say, hey, this is the code terminology, but these are also terms that you'll hear pretty frequently, you know, don't be confused by that. 